things that we often tell people is you need to do the will of God. You need to do what God's asking you to do. Find out where God wants you and go do it. And a question always rises. So what's his will? What does he want me to do? What specific mission does he have for me? How do you find out? It's a good question. Something many Christians struggle with. And then there's always the question of certainty. Am I certain that what I'm doing is what God? How do you know? The Christmas drama is the story of the birth of Jesus. Spread over two Gospels, <coughs> contains four acts. This morning we're going to look at the first one. In the first act of the Christmas drama, we see God setting the stage. He's getting things ready, setting up the context, we would say. God's the playwright, director, producer. But he uses individuals, like you and me, as the actors on the stage. And in Christmas drama, we see God working through individual lives. And in Act 1, we see God painting the decorations, getting the costumes in order. Doing what he has to do. <coughs> planning it out. God is the ultimate planner. We quote verses like Jeremiah, I know, I have, I have plans to prosper you. We Look at what Paul wrote in Ephesians, that God has created us for specific, for specific purposes that he planned ahead of time. God is the ultimate planner, and the Christmas drama is no different. That's the way God works. He plans things out. So go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 1. Act 1 is located in Luke chapter 1. Now, I'm not going to read the entire screenplay. When God writes a screenplay, he writes it in detail. Act 1 consists of Luke 1 verses 5 through 24, then picks up in verses 57, goes through verse 80. He gets into detail. We're going to look at the highlights this morning. Act 1 is a story about a man named Zacharias, some translations will say Zechariah. But Zacharias was an average guy, he was a priest. In this particular year he was working in the temple, it was his turn to do the duties in the temple. But he was not one of the elite priests, he was just an average priest. Didn't serve in a mega synagogue, probably never never would have at this time in life. Didn't really strive for that. He just simply did the best he could to serve God and to do the right thing. He was essentially a small town priest, you would say, a small town country preacher. Just doing the best he can to serve God. Well, he was at the temple one day, doing his duties, and God showed up. Well, specifically an angel of the Lord, but with a message from God. And this angel said to him in verse 13, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You see, they were old. Zacharias and Elizabeth were getting up in years, and despite everything he's been doing, he suffered one humiliation, and he didn't have a son. So God sends his angel to church and says, Zacharias, the Lord has said you will have a son, but not just any son. This isn't just any son. No. Verse 17. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and the disobedient to the, act, to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Your son is going to be the forerunner to Messiah. He's not just any boy. He has a specific role. Now this will make any father <laughs> jump for joy. Wow, I'm going to have a son. And man, see, he's going to be important. Woo and Zacharias' answer was, and not that. He didn't leap for joy. He looked at the angel and said, yeah, right. I'm going to have a son. Sure. Uh, is there anything in that incense I shouldn't be inhaling? I'm going to have a son? No. Right. Sorry, not buying it. Now, how do we know this, is, this was his response? The angel, verse 19, says, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. It's going to happen, Zacharias, if you believe it, you believe it or not. It's going to happen. But you didn't believe God. So you have been silenced. How many times does God do something around us? Do something in our lives and we don't see it. Or we choose to ignore it. We don't want to believe that that really can happen. God may be trying to reveal something to us, but we don't want to hear it. We, we close our ears and cover our eyes and cover our mouth and we hear no message, speak no message, see no message. Just like Zacharias. Stubborn because it doesn't fit the way we think it should go. Oh, it can't happen that way. Oh, uh, that's not the way it works, God. Here's how it really works. So what you're trying to tell me, I'm just not going to listen to because I'm sorry, I just can't buy it. And God's answer to Zacharias is, you will be silent. We need to open up our eyes to what God is trying to tell us in our lives. Open up our hearts to the message that God is trying to reveal to us. It may be something critical. And by the way, if it's from God, it's critical. So Zacharias was silenced. Now, he was in there for a while, longer than normal. The people outside were getting a little nervous. What's taking him so long? Finally, he comes out, and he's making a bunch of gestures, trying to say what's happening, and nothing. Nothing. <coughs> now, wives, I'm sure many of you would appreciate if your husbands could be silent and just listen for a while. But I will speak from a man's point of view, a husband's view. We may be silent. Doesn't mean we're listening. Husbands. <laughs> we don't always listen. Zacharias didn't listen. But his wife seemed to get the message. After three days, after these days, his wife. Elizabeth became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. She got it. She understood what's going on. She said, The Lord has shown, has, has shown favor to me. He's blessed me. Zacharias said, Yeah, right. She says, Thank you. She's opened her eyes. He's busy trying to cover them. Now, fast forward a few verses to 57. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. And as was tradition, the family was around, the friends were around, and they celebrated this. In fact, the angel told Zacharias, this will be a time of joy. And they celebrated the birth of the son. 
John is born. He's been, oh, there was joy everywhere. And so they're getting ready to, to write down the paperwork, get the birth certificate ready. And, hey, Elizabeth, you're Zacharias' son, Zacharias, right? His name's Zacharias. No, you know, his name's John. John, there's nobody in your family named John. You can't name him. That's not the tradition. You, you can't go against tradition. We never see that here. You gotta name him somebody that's in the family. No, his name's John. No, it cannot be John. I'm personal with that name personally, but you can't name it's not in the family. Allow me a digression here. I can somewhat relate to John. When my parents went to name me, they knew that they had to pick a name that would be acceptable. So they went through and looked for names that were in neither family. Because if they went with one family or the other, the, the other one would be upset. So they went through and said, there's nobody named John. We'll name him John. And turns out that on my father's side, there was a long, long tradition of naming the firstborn son, Johan. John. <laughs> so there, the Roger family was, woo, they named him John. And of course, on the my mother's side, the Gibbons side, the patriarch of the family, Sam Gibbons, he was a judge in Texas. Turns out his first name was John. So they were, woo, you named him after Sam Gibbons. Woo. Everybody was happy, and they tried to go with a name that wasn't in the family. They got one that was. So I can relate to John. They're trying to go with a name, and they're saying, it's not in the family. And their answer is, no. He's going to be John, but they didn't listen to that until Zacharias, in verse 63, asked for something to write on and wrote down, his name is John. And if he was able to say those words, I'd him say, his name is John, end of story. <laughs> and thus, was his name. And at that moment, all of a sudden, he could speak. And what did he say? He said, Hallelujah, I got my voice back. No, he didn't. Verse 67 After his father Zacharias, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. The first thing he said was prophecy. Verses 68 through 75 actually are a prophecy about the Messiah. Verses 76 through 79 are about John. Now this is interesting. I speak from experience here. Everybody who's a parent can relate to this. When your child is born, the first thing you want to tell somebody is how beautiful your baby is, how wonderful it is, how what a blessing. You want to just share your newborn child. Look at my baby girl. Look at my baby boy. Zacharias didn't talk about his own child first. He talked about another person. Messiah. The first thing he said was about the Christ. Greek word for Messiah. Then he got to his son. After Messiah. And he says in verse 76 through 79, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, which is what the angel told him would happen, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit, will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Something interesting about John's message. John was going to be the forerunner for Christ. And he had a specific message he was going to be proclaiming. What is it? He will give people knowledge of salvation, forgiveness of their sins, 
then the mercy of God, he will share the gospel before Messiah comes. John was to share the gospel, spread the message, the good news, before the coming of Christ. And we are the modern day John. We are to proclaim the same message before the second coming of Messiah. John did it before the first. We do it before the second. Amen. Are we doing it? John grew up and ended up living in the desert for a while before his ministry began. That's for Satan. But another thing that's interesting about this prophecy, Zacharias and Elizabeth were given some clues. In this divine drama, we see that they're given clues as to what's going to be happening. They weren't given the details. They didn't know when exactly Messiah was coming. They knew in their lives Messiah would come, but they didn't know when. But this angel from the Lord and the birth of their son gave him a clue. He's coming soon. Real soon. It could have been 10 years after their son was born. It could have been 50 years. It could have been 6 weeks. They didn't know. By the way, Jesus is coming back at any moment. We don't know where. But they were given clues. And they realized from what God is doing, setting the stage for the climactic event, they learned what their role was. And they saw, finally, Elizabeth saw, and finally Zechariah saw what God was doing in their lives. But they weren't alone. Verse 65. Fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For well, the hand of the Lord will certainly with him. God was moving, and people noticed. People noticed. They realized God was at work in this family. They didn't understand what or why, but there was something going on. And today, the same thing happens. When God is at work in lives, people notice. People outside of our lives notice. They may not often say God's at work, but they will say something's going on. They see it. And word spreads. The question is, do we see it? Do we see it in our lives? Or are we too much like Zacharias, doubting, <coughs> disbelieving, closing our eyes? I began by asking, how do you know what God's will is for our lives? How do you know what God wants us to do? Act one of the divine drama, the Christmas drama, tells us how to discover the answer. Knowing what God has in store for us requires seeing what God is doing in our lives. Knowing what God has in store for us requires seeing what God is doing in our lives. Amen. You want to know what God's will is for you? See what he's already doing. See where he's already at work. Henry Blackaby learned this lesson. And from this lesson, he wrote Experiencing God. That study teaches you and me if you want to know what to do in the will of God, see where God's at work and join in. Look around you. See what God's doing in your life and what it says about what God is wanting for you. The clues are there. People have noticed. Have we noticed? God sets the stage. He always gets things prepared. He always is, has a plan. Scripture makes that very clear. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. But what is it? What are your abilities? Your talents? Your gifts? Do you 
resource control, physical and, and material? What are your opportunities? What have others been saying that, that they see God doing in your life? What does this tell you? The way to know what God's will is for us is to see what God's already doing in our lives. We just have to be willing to open up our eyes and see. And not be like Zacharias. Calloused, closed, unwilling to listen or believe. Instead, choosing to be like Elizabeth and the community. Something's 